Good morning. Please turn in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 7. Our, our text this morning will, become, will come from Isaiah 7 through Isaiah chapter 12, and we'll begin there momentarily. Before we begin, let's go ahead and go to God in a word of prayer. Father, thank you for this day and the blessings you've given to us. Thank you for the ability to come here this morning to learn more about you. We're grateful, Father, for your church. We're grateful, Father, for your, your son who sacrificed his life so that we can have life eternal. We pray, Father, that we can learn from your people. From years gone by, we learn from their mistakes. We learn from their victories. We learn from their failures. Please be with us as we study your word. Help us to grow in knowledge, and please give us the wisdom to apply it to our lives. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. If you know much about the, the book of Isaiah, you know that the prophet himself lived in the 8th century. And he predominantly prophesied to the nation of Judah, which was the southern kingdom, because during this time you had both the nation of Israel, the northern kingdom, and the southern kingdom of Judah. And you probably remember from Bible class that Israel is not a very good nation. Their kings are not very good at all. And eventually in 722, the, the nation of Israel is destroyed. Samaria, the capital, is sacked. And those who are in that kingdom are taken off into captivity. It's around that time that we find this text in Isaiah chapter 7. Assyria was a brute force. It was an issue to be dealt with. And if you remember, just south of Assyria, you had the nation of Syria. And at this time, Rezin is their king. He rules there in Damascus. And just below him in the nation of Israel, you have Pekah, who is the king of Israel. Now, Israel and uh, Syria have made an alliance. They've made a pact at this time to fight off the Assyrians because the Assyrians are coming through. And if you know anything about the Assyrians, you know how brute and how evil and wicked they are. They don't make peace treaties. They beat you into submission. If you were a king or a dignitary and you went to Nineveh, which is the capital of Assyria, and you were to go through the palaces um, or the, the halls of the palace and you were to look at the walls and you were to look at the inscriptions and the, the, the drawings and different stuff, you wouldn't see rainbows and unicorns. You wouldn't see an olive branch of people making peace. You would see... Images of Assyrian soldiers playing games with the decapitated skulls of, of people they've conquered and people that they've conquered up impaled on, on long rods. As a warning for people who came through, we make peace in only one way. You will bow down, you will be our vassal, or we will conquer you, we will destroy you. And it's this force that Syria and Israel join this alliance to combat. And they come down and they want King Ahaz's help, who's king of Judah at this time. And they want a treaty with Ahaz so that they can fight off these Assyrian brutes. Now, Ahaz doesn't do it. And if you know anything about Ahaz, you go back to 2 Kings chapter 16, you read about him there. He's not a very good king. He's not faithful to God in the slightest. He worships in the high places. He even offered his children uh, to pass through the fire, probably to the, the pagan god Molech. He sacrificed them to the pagan god. He, he turned his back so far away from God that, I'll, I'll cut to the end here, Assyria destroys Syria and, um, uh, and Israel. And whenever... Whenever Ahaz goes up to meet with the king of Assyria in Syria at the land of Damascus, he looks around and he notices a temple to the, the, the Syrian god Hadad. And when he sees the temple, he, goes, he sends a letter back to the high priest Uriah and he says, I want you to build one of these in Jerusalem. Then when he comes back down, he takes the bronze altar from the temple of Yahweh and he takes the bronze altar and he places it into his new uh, temple that he's created after the, the, the Syrians. And he offers sacrifices for it there. A wicked king. A truly evil king. And in fact, 2 Kings chapter 16 says that he even had his child pass through the flame. He offered it as a sacrifice. He's not a good person. And what's fascinating is you read more in that text, 
it says that he takes gold and silver from the house of God. Not only does he take the bronze altar for himself, he takes the gold and the silver from the house of God and he offers it as a sacrifice to the king of Assyria. He says, please don't kill me. Here, take this gold, take this silver, and he pays him off. It's interesting because when we get to our text here in Isaiah chapter 7, we're going to start in verse 10. I want you to notice the dialogue. Isaiah is told by God to go to Ahaz, and, and it says there the Lord spoke to Ahaz. Ask a sign. Ask a sign of the Lord your God. Let it be as deep as Sheol, all the way to the grave, or as high as the heavens. But... God says, ask anything, seek my favor, bow to me, bring your burdens to me. But Ahaz says, but I will not ask and I will not put the Lord to the test. And that response seems like he's doing the right thing, right? I don't want to tempt the Lord my God. That's not what he's saying. God says, let me be your, fa your father. As Jesus says, seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open to you. Ask the father and he will give it to you. God wants that relationship with us. He wanted that relationship with Ahaz and Ahaz says, no. I'm not going to ask the Lord my God for anything, but I'll ask the king of Assyria. I won't put my faith in the Yahweh. I'll put my faith in the king of Assyria because he's a bad dude. And look at how God responds. Verse 13, he says, Hear then, O house of David, is it too little for you to weary men that you weary my God also? Verse 14, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. If you're not going to ask me for one, I'm going to give you one. What sign are you going to give us? Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Now, I want you to notice something here. You probably have a footnote or something in your Bible, depending on which translation you have. A, trans, a few translations uh, uh, several years ago got in trouble because they translated the word virgin here as young maiden. And it comes from the Hebrew word Alma. And there's an interesting history with that word. It can mean virgin, but most often it just means a young girl. So I want you to understand that when prophecies happen, what's the context of Isaiah 7 through 12? The context is Assyria, 8th century B.C., dealing with the Assyrian armies, dealing with the Syrian and the, the Israelite armies. That's the context. And what you'll notice in Scripture that whenever you have these prophecies that we look back 2,000 years after Jesus, that we don't really appreciate what's going on. The prophecy has to do with that time. If you, if, for example, 2 Samuel chapter 7, when David is told that he's going to have a descendant sit on his throne, there's a partial prophecy talking about Solomon. But when he talks about the eternal throne, he's talking about something more that we'll talk about a little bit later on that the prophets understood that came long after David. David was promised something that was tangible, something physical in his time. But the promise carried with it something much greater that was going to come about at a later time that had larger implications. It was a larger blessing from God. Same thing here. In this day and time, it doesn't necessarily mean that a virgin is going to give birth, but a young woman. Most likely a virgin, but a young woman. Okay? What's interesting about this text, even though this word, there's some ambiguity there, it could be virgin, could be young woman, whenever the Old Testament, the Hebrew Old Testament, is translated into Greek around the roughly the second century, this text specifically, the word parthenos is used here. And that word is more specific. So roughly 150, 200 years before the time of Jesus, the word parthenos is used here, and that word in Greek is virgin, not young maiden. So 200 years before the time of Jesus, the understanding was that this text had a larger implication in the word virgin is used. And in Matthew chapter 1, verse 23, that's what he is, is discussing, and that's why he draws attention to this text. 
But that is the sign that God is going to give. But listen to what he's going to name him. Emmanuel, again, your footnote will say God with us. Keep that in mind because we'll look at that a little bit later on. I'm going to skip down because I want you to understand a lot of this has to do with, again, the Assyrian conflict that's going on during Isaiah's life at this time. Get down to chapter 8. We're going to start around verse 5. Now God is going to start talking about what Assyria is going to do to the Syrians and to the nation of Israel and even to the nation of Judah. It says, The Lord spoke to me again. This is Isaiah. Because this people has refused the waters of Shiloh they, that flow gently and rejoice over Rezin, again, the king of Syria, and the son of Ramaliah, again, that is um, um, Pekah, uh, the, the king of the, the Israelite uh, kingdom. Therefore, behold, the Lord is bringing up against them the waters of the river, mighty and many, the king of Assyria and all his glory. And it will rise over all its channels and go over all its banks and it will sweep on into Judah. It will overflow and pass on, reaching even to the neck. And its outspread wings will fill the breath of your land. Whose land? O Emmanuel. O God with us. Assyria is coming. They're going to come even to surround Jerusalem. And we know that from both archaeological findings uh, as well as the text of Scripture. Hezekiah was able to withstand the Assyrian armies, something no one in that land at that time could do. And he did it by, by submitting to the will and the power of God. But we see that as it's spoken here, it says, Outspread wings will fill the breath of your land, O Emmanuel, God with us. Continue to read down. Verse 9, Be broken, your peoples, and be shattered. Give ear, all you far enemies. Strap on the armor and be shattered. Strap on your armor and be shattered. Take counsel together, but it will come to nothing. Speak a word, but it will not stand, for God is with us. If you have a footnote there, that name again is Emmanuel. God with us. What is that alluding back to? Chapter 7, verse 14. The virgin shall bring forth the son, and you shall call his name Emmanuel. God with us. Whose land is it? Emmanuel. Who's got the authority over the nations? They'll plot together, just like Psalm 2 says. They will plot together. They will try to go against God. And in Psalm chapter 2, it says, and his anointed, his Messiah. But what does it say here? But it will not stand for Emmanuel. Read down further, verse 14 of the same text. And he will become a sanctuary and a stone of offense and a rock of stumbling to both houses of Israel, a trap and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Where have we heard that for, before? Paul talks about that in Romans chapter 9, verse 33, talking about Jesus. Jesus is the, the stone of stumbling. He is the rock that causes offense. Go to chapter 9 before our time gets away from us too far here. In Isaiah chapter 9, it says, But there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. And in the former time he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. If you look at the map, um, you will notice that Zebulun and Naphtali are where Jesus lived, where he grew up. He was born in Bethlehem the city of David, right outside of Jerusalem. But he was raised in Nazareth. Where is that? Where does Jesus spend most of his ministry? Up at Capernaum, up around the Sea of Galilee, in the land of Zebulun, in the land of Naphtali. It once they walked in darkness, but a great light has shone. Matthew 4 alludes to this. He quotes this text in Matthew 4, 14 through 16. If you look at John chapter 7, verse 52, where Nicodemus speaks up among the Sanhedrin, among the uh, Jewish leaders, he says, is it right for a man to be uh, convicted before he's tried in our law? And they say, are you a Galilean too? Search the scriptures. You know no prophet comes from Galilee. Look at Isaiah chapter 9. And look at what Jesus says in, in John chapter 8, verse 12. I am the light of the world. I am the light. 
this great light coming from the land of Galilee. What does it say there? The people who walked in darkness, Isaiah 9, 2. The people walked in darkness but have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. Continue reading down, verse 6. For to us a child is born. Again, reminiscent of that Isaiah 7, verse 14 text. A child is born, to us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, El Gabor, Everlasting Father, Aviad, Prince of Peace. Now you could say, some would say, okay, well, El, sometimes the word for God is sometimes used for a, a, a mighty man. And you could say Gabor could be used as a strong soldier, a mighty man. But Aviad, Everlasting Father. To, to say that that is a mere human is blasphemous. God, in this time, in the 8th century, when they're dealing with the issue of, of Syria and Assyria and the northern kingdom's conflict, God gives them a hint of hope. He says, I will give you a sign. I will give you a son. A child is born. The government will rest on his shoulders. On his shoulders. Continue reading. Of the increase of his government and the peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness. And uh, from this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. All right, we're going to skip ahead a little bit. Go to chapter 10. You see in chapter 10 that God, after using the force of Assyria to punish his people, then he brings judgment upon Assyria. And when he brings judgment upon the, the, the nation of Assyria, he uses the Babylonians who come also again from the north. And they come in and eventually destroy the southern kingdom as well. And the temple is destroyed in 586 under the reign of Nebuchadnezzar. But it's important for, him, for, for someone to look at this and understand, how could God use an unrighteous nation? God created all humans. He created all things. And God will do what he decides to do because he has a plan in mind. You can look back at all the things that were done in the nation of Judah and the nation of Israel. And you can say, why would God allow that? God has a plan for all nations to be blessed under the offspring of Abraham. And Paul says in Galatians that the, it says offspring, not offsprings. It, the promise was given through Abraham or given to Abraham through Isaac, through Jacob, through Judah, through David. But it wasn't them. It was the prophecy concerning his son. God had a plan for the house of Judah, for the tribe of Judah, and his name was Jesus the Christ. And the government rests on his shoulders. But God, after using Assyria, he says, Woe to you, verse uh, 5 of chapter 10, Woe to you, Assyria, the rod of my anger, the staff in their hands is my fury. Against a godless nation I send him, and against the people of my wrath I command him to take spoil and seize plunder and to tread them down like the mire of the streets. But he does not so intend, and his heart does not so think. But it is in his heart to destroy and to cut off nations, not a few, for he says... Are not my commanders all kings? Is not Kalno like uh, Carchemish? Is not Hamath like Arpad? Is not Samaria like Damascus? As my hand has reached the kingdoms of the idols whose carved images were greater than those of Jerusalem and Samaria, shall I not do to Jerusalem and her idols as I have done to Samaria and her images? But it says this, When the Lord has finished all his work on Mount Zion and on Jerusalem, he will punish the speech of the arrogant heart of the king of Assyria and the boastful look in his eyes. Assyria, you may think that you are mighty, but God has given you strength right now. And he's going to take that strength away. You think you are mighty, you will be brought to naught. Continue reading. In verse 20 of chapter 10 here, we begin talking about the remnant that will come back to the nation of Israel. And part of the people do come back into the northern kingdom. They're brought down by the Assyrians. They intermarry and eventually become a hodgepodge of different religions in the northern kingdom. 
Now, there is some straightening up by the time Jesus comes along in John chapter 4, but there is a lot of baggage between the Samaritans and the Jews from Judea and from other places. But again, we don't have time for that this morning. Isaiah chapter 11. When we get to Isaiah chapter 11, we've already had this hinted at, if you go back to Isaiah chapter, chapter 9 there, where it says in verse 7, of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it. We're going to get into a text of scripture where we tar- start talking about the root of Jesse. Now this is an important principle, it's an important thought, it carries along throughout the prophets. Um, I'll give you, just for the sake of time, I'll give you some references Jeremiah chapter 23 verse 5 talks about the, the, the root, the branch rather of, of David. Um, Zechariah 6, 12 through 13, again talking about that branch, the root of Jesse. Uh, you could go back to Genesis 49, 8 through 12 when God, uh, when, excuse me, uh, Israel is laying on his deathbed and he makes the promise to Judah that the scepter shall never depart from his hand. 2 Samuel 7, 12 through 13 and verse 16 that we've already talked about where God promises David that he will establish his kingdom forever. Psalm 89 is a great psalm altogether. You can look at verses 3 through 4, verses uh, 29, 35 through 37. Um, and it talks about the promise given to David that his throne would be an eternal throne. But by the time you get to Isaiah, you get to Ezekiel, you have this promise. In Ezekiel chapter 34, you have a problem. You have a condemnation against the the shepherds of Israel. And God says, I will set up my shepherd David to tend my flock. Well, David's been long dead. What's he talking about? He's talking about the Messiah that will come from the tribe of David, from the from the the, um, seed of David. But verse 11, or excuse me, chapter 11, verse 1 of Isaiah. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from the root shall bear fruit. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide disputes by what his ears hear. But with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity the, of the meek of the earth. And he shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with his, the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked." Go on down, continue reading verse 10. In that day, the root of Jesse uh, who shall stand as a signal for the peoples. Of him shall the nations inquire, and his resting place shall be glorious. Now, I want you to understand what's being said there in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 10. The promise isn't just to Judah. All nations will be richly blessed through the seed of Abraham. Who is that? It's Jesus. Go back and read Daniel chapter 7. When, when Daniel sees the four beasts coming out of the water, he's fixated on that fourth beast. And as we see in Romans, or excuse me, Revelation chapter 13, as it goes in reverse order, that fourth beast is the Roman Empire that looks and carries a lot of the, the, the principles that the empires that came before him, whether it's the bear or the lion or the leopard, that fourth beast took all of those attributes and became a terrifying nation and conquered against the Lord and his people. But the Lord is victorious. That is the book of Revelation, right? But if you look at that, you notice what he's talking about. And and, and Daniel's fixated on that fourth beast. He he, he completely misses the the vision where it says in the night sky that the the ancient of days is sat on his throne. And it says one as as the, the son of man is presented before the ancient of days. And the peoples of the earth worship him. It is blasphemous if that is not God. You shall have no other gods before me. There is something greater coming. Don't worry about Assyria. Don't worry about Babylon who is to follow. Put your fear into me. Fear me. Respect me. Honor me. For I am giving you something greater. I am giving you power over death in my son Jesus Christ. What does he say in Isaiah chapter 12? You go there, verse 2. says, Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and I will not be afraid. For the Lord God is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation, and you will say in that day, Give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deed among the peoples. Proclaim that his name is exalted. Sing praises to Yahweh, for he has done uh, gloriously. 
Let this be made known in all of the earth. Shout and sing for joy, O inhabitant of Zion. For great in your midst is the Holy One of Israel. He is your salvation. How did this text start? Ahaz, go to the Lord. Ask the Lord for a a, a blessing. Ask the Lord for for a, a sign. And Ahaz says, no. I'll go to Assyria. I'll ask him for for favor. Isaiah finishes this text by saying, Seek the Lord. The God of heaven and earth is my salvation. Sidebar, that word salvation there is the word in Hebrew, Yeshua. It's where we get the name Iezus in Greek, which is... uh, means salvation. It's translated to Jesus into English. Jesus' name means Yahweh saves. There's something in his name. And as our time comes to a close, I want us to take this text, this block of text filled with so many prophecies concerning our Lord, and look at even though you had a people in a day and time that was worried about what was going on in their life at that time, God had a bigger plan for them, and that was Jesus Christ. As we look at this text and we see the faults of the people that came before us and we look down and we see what the message is, the message is put your faith and hope in Christ. He is resurrected from the dead. We serve a risen Lord. If you look in Acts chapter 2, verses 33 and following, when Peter talks about the promise given to David about someone seated on his throne forever, He says, God was speaking about the resurrection of Jesus. And this Jesus whom you crucified, he has made him both Lord and Christ, Messiah. He is his anointed. Go back and read Psalm 2. He is his anointed. And what do they say? What should we do then? We've crucified the Lord. He says, repent and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Right? So when we look at this text of Isaiah chapter 7 through 12, let us learn from those who came before us. Thank you.